Shalom, shalom. <clears throat> My name is Davon Mays, and today we are going to be talking about Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm going to be approaching this from a very simple point of view. Um, many, many commentaries and oceans and oceans of knowledge on this just this one verse. Um, but I'm going to walk through it a little bit and um, just keep it as simple as possible. So in the beginning, God created the Aleph and the Toph. Um, This would be the beginning and the end. So the word 853 in the Strong's, Ot, F, depending on your, um, you know, your dialect, uh, Strong's Concordance, untranslatable mark of the accusative case. So <clears throat> I said I was going to keep this simple, but there is one secret that I wanted to point out. Bereshit bara Elohim at. So depending on, you know, how deep of a level that you're in, you know, if you're beginning, beginner in um, Hebrew, <clears throat> you probably won't understand this, but um, grab some dictionaries, grab some commentaries, you know, you'll understand. All of Tav, the beginning, the end, the, in other words, the Alpha and the Omega. <clears throat> a lot of the teachings come from this verse because it's basically telling you in the beginning, God created the beginning and the ending right there in the very first verse of Genesis. So no one can find out Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So, it's very interesting that we as people cannot grasp that God doesn't have a time frame. You know, what was he doing before he created people? How can he just always have been like that doesn't make sense to us because we live in time. You know, we're, we, we measure everything in time and years and he's not subject to that. So it's just a fascinating concept altogether. Declaring the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46 and 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Well, God's counsel was that he created the heavens and the earth and they still stand today. Ecclesiastes 7 and 8, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. So people always ask, you know, why did God create all the world? If he can see the future, why did he create a world with all these problems? And we're going through all these things. Why didn't he just create us and put us in heaven? And we wouldn't have to go through all that. Well, there's a concept called the bread of shame. Meaning if you don't work for something, you don't feel you deserve it. You won't appreciate it. And the fact that he said the end of a thing is better than its beginning. It was worth all the things that people go through and um, you just got to work through it. You know, people can't wait till they retire. They can't wait to go on vacation, but before you go on vacation, you got to pack your bags. You got to get everything ready. You got to go to the airport, wait in lines, and then you get your vacation, you know, at the end, at the end of the matter, you went on vacation. So the end of a matter is better than the beginning. Proverbs 20 and 21 an inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. So moving too fast with certain situations, they don't work out so good. And God has shown us process and patience. So <clears throat> we really have to practice um, learning the processes of things and um, patience. You know, a, a child takes nine months to come to the world, but it's well worth it. But you got to wait. You can't rush such things and um his his patience is on a, a grand scale that we can't even imagine so you know we we definitely have someone to learn these these concepts from time energy material or vessels so in the beginning this will be our concept of time because we know beginnings of things uh, but god doesn't have a beginning but for us <clears throat> he gave us a a, a point of reference Time, the indefinite continued prog progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as a whole. God created energy to create something. 
um, you basically create some type of energy or matter, which, you know, matter is just, you know, a different form of energy. So this is the strength and vitality required for sustained physical or mental activity. Because when you close your eyes and you see images and, you know, things of this nature, it requires some type of energy to see the lights. You know, you don't see things in the dark. When you imagine things, you see the light. You can imagine the sun. That's light. That's some type of energy giving you this capacity of, a, of, a, of an image. The heavens and the earth. These are vessels. A hollow container, especially one used to hold liquid, such as a bowl or cask or a planet. Instead of an planet, or a planet. Because the planet, Earth, definitely holds a lot of water. So, you know, our bodies hold water. We're vessels. We're, we're, <clears throat> we, we hold things. We hold information. Our brains hold, I don't even know how to measure how much information the human brain can hold. Just like a computer, you know. In, um, in measuring these things, it's, it's vast. So time, energy, material, or vessels. God created all these things with the purpose, the time so we can measure events, the energy so we can create things because we ourselves are creators and you need energy to create. And we know how to shape and mold materials or vessels. And we use these vessels and we ourselves are used by God as vessels to get things done. It says he took Adam and placed him in the garden to work. That was a vessel for him to work. God used Adam to work the earth. So when Adam needed energy, <laughs> right? He needed something to work. And this would be another vessel to be worked on. So it's a, it's a whole combination of, of things that was created. How to measure time. Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be luminaries in the expanse of the heavens to separate between the day and the night. And they shall be for signs and for appointed seasons and for days and years so we know we have calendars you know um, watches sundials lots of different ways to measure time and um, of course the the sun and the, the, the stars people use them to navigate especially um, um, captains of ships in ancient times <clears throat> even probably today you know we got gps and things like that but you know some people are still smart enough to use these signs um Isaiah 47 and 13, you are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the month monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. So we also have people who can read these stars and times and things of that nature. Um, sometimes it's not always correct, but they're people who have these talents. And unfortunately, in this specific verse, these people were not able to see their way out of a problem, even though they knew it was going to come. So we have, we have this knowledge and we have this information and it was all created. And of course, with anything, you can use things for good or for bad. You can use a gun for good or bad. You can use water for good or bad. You can use food for good or bad. You know, people can take any situation or anything and use it for a negative purpose. The astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators. So we have Bacoca Bean. We have Samavin and we have Hobare. So stargazers, astrologers, and another word for astrologers. So this ancient wisdom is um, something that a lot of people overlook. Um, the ancient Babylonians and the Chaldeans were masters of these things. Um, Abraham was aware of these things. So <clears throat> There is wisdom and knowledge in these things, but again, people can abuse this information. So um, I'm not promoting or neither am I um, dismissing this ancient wisdom that we still have and use today. What is God? If God created the heavens and the earth, what is God? Job 36 and 26, behold, God is great, and we do not know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered. So when it said earlier, he put eternity into our hearts, so we will not know what he's been doing from the beginning to the end. That's the simple truth. His years cannot be discovered. 
Um, it's just one of those things that if you get to live eternally <clears throat> in his presence, maybe we can ask some good questions, you know? Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So we don't know what God is, what he is. We know of a creator. But we don't know what God is. He's not energy. <clears throat> a lot of people would assume he is energy now. He created energy as we know it, like power, for instance. And to create a sun, there had to be some dynamic force, power, ability, electricity, whatever you want to call that, heat, whatever you want to measure that in to create a sun, um, to create a planet that spews lava. There had to be some power behind that. But God itself, he himself is not power. He displays power he displays energy but that's not what he is it's more of a conscious a consciousness um more of a spiritual thing um and i think job says it perfectly we do not know him we know of god we know what he's capable we don't even know what he's capable of but we know what we've seen him be capable of and when he says he's capable of, but we don't really know exactly what he can do on the on the grand scale. We see the heavens and the stars and the billions of galaxies and the wisdom he put in the earth and the human brain and the knowledge that we have and how we can create things, technology and rockets and phones and all these things. But we don't really know how vast... <laughs> the the wisdom that he would you know possess it's um the number of his years cannot be discovered nor can we know what he knows then i guess we would be god right <clears throat> what is god is god energy psalm 33 and 6 by the word of the lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth so he spoke the universe into existence. You can say that that's some type of energy, some type of power, some type of big bang concept, you know, some forces collided and created things, or these words were spoken and the vibrations created everything. So Psalm 1989, forever, oh Lord, your word, your word is settled in heaven, meaning the vibrations, the when God uttered, whatever he uttered to create the heavens and the earth, speaking of the Sephiroth, these things are still standing. They're still vibrating. They're still active. They, they haven't ceased to act since he spoke these words. You can say, you know, you can't destroy energy. So whatever he uttered, whatever that power or vibration was cannot be destroyed because that's what's sustaining our existence today. Words are sounds or vibrations. It takes some type of friction to make noises or notes. Something has to move the objects to make the friction, such as the breath going between the lips and the movement of the tongue as breath goes across it, passing the teeth, blowing into an instrument or striking a piano key, etc. This force is a way to describe God, but he does not have a mouth. These are only descriptions, but not his form. It, the Torah says, and God spoke, and he said, and Smoke comes up into his nose, but those are just describing, you know, things we can relate to. The sun is energy we can see, feel, and harness. We cannot see, feel, or harness God like we do the power of the sun. We can only see and feel the results of his actions physically and emotionally. So when he gave the Torah, we harness his words, his, 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 his wisdom, his knowledge. We, that's what the Torah is, is, is God's basically God's version of transferring his knowledge or, you know, information to us, but his actual being, we, we can't, we really don't understand what that is. We just know the results when he says in the, you know, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he saw a vision or something of that nature. 
we see what the prophets experienced, but that was not who God is. That's something he can do. So there's, there's two different things. So choosing to know or not to know, Proverbs 129, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So we have choices. We're not robots. You can choose the fear of the Lord in the beginning of fear. I mean, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God because fear makes you calculate, makes you think twice about, you know, your next step. It's not that you're just walking around terrified of God. You just have a fear of a healthy fear, just like you would before you approach a cliff or before you approach the ocean. If you don't know how to swim, you know, you're probably going to fear that water because it can be dangerous. Job 28, 28. And to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Psalm 111 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praises, his praise endures forever. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. So when you understand something, it's a great thing because we know um, Solomon tells us um, gain wisdom, gain knowledge, but above all things, gain understanding. Isaiah 66 and four. So will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them? Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. So since you didn't choose God, he will choose for you. So I will choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. We know there's a verse that says, what you fear will come upon you. And it's basically not so much a punishment, but avoiding a warning. If there's a lake and the sign says no swimming, crocodiles in the water, and you go in that water and there's crocodiles and they get a hold of you, was that a punishment or was that you avoiding the warning? So, you know, um, that's a choice. That's not a robot. We have these, we have to make good choices. Choosing not to know, Jeremiah 24, 7. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And they shall return to me with their whole heart. So when you choose God, he chooses you. Jeremiah 31, 34. No more shall each, <clears throat> no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest them of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So we have choices to make and choices come with consequences and rewards. So just be aware of that. So we can choose to know that God created the heavens and the earth, or we can ignore that and think we're just randomly here and nothing I do, do matters. And I can just, you know, live my life however I want. And when I die, that's it. I just go back into nothingness. Or you can know that God created the heavens and the earth with a purpose and you will be judged for everything you do. And there's reasons behind all this. And this is why the, this is why the Torah, which means instructions, was given to us. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Deuteronomy 30 and 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, Blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Choose, choose, choose life. Don't choose death and cursing. Exodus 7, 3. So this is a very famous verse or concept that is, you know, needs to be explained. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So if God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart, that doesn't sound like any free choice, right? Exodus 8.15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Now, <clears throat> what did God say? 
For I have hardened his heart in the hearts of his servants. Exodus 10 and 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart in the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him. So let's read 1 Samuel 6 and 6 and compare these. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? So did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did, or did Pharaoh harden his heart? So when you read the story in Exodus, Pharaoh hardened his heart first. And when he kept doing it, then God hardened his heart. Just like before, when it says, choose life, choose this, choose that. Then it says, since they did not listen when I called, then I chose their delusions. So when you're given a chance and a choice and you blow it after so many times, God will get rid of his patience or run out of patience, just like any parent. And then the punishment comes. You get so many warnings. And every time... Pharaoh or Moses would tell in the book of Exodus, Moses would tell Pharaoh, you know, well, I'm going to do this and let the people go. Pharaoh would say, OK, and then he would go back on his word. To where Moses had to keep had to tell him at one point, like, stop playing. You know, last time you said you was going to let the people go, like, quit playing. Like, you, you only going to get so many chances is basically what it's saying. So it says, <clears throat> Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? It doesn't say God hardened their hearts right here. He eventually did, but they had a choice. And we know they had a choice because there's a verse in Exodus that says, um, when there, a certain plague came, it says, the Egyptians that feared the Lord brought their animals in and they weren't harmed. So that means there were some Egyptians that did fear God and choose the fear of the Lord. <laughs> and that's why their animals got saved and nobody else's did. Right. So you got to put things in context and you have to keep reading. You can't cherry pick verses. Knowing God on another level, we only experience what we perceive with our senses and our imagination. We are limited in this physical realm and physical body. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So this is another level of experiencing God. If your spirit was to return to God, what information would it take back with it? You would know God on a physical level. Then when that spirit returned to God, you will experience him on a whole other level. Genesis 35 and 18, and so it was as her soul was departing for she died. And she called his name ben Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. Excuse me. <clears throat> so this shows us when you die, your soul leaves. Her soul was departing. Where did it go? Well, Ecclesiastes told us the spirit will return to God who gave it. So when she died and her soul departed, you know, the body gets cold, rigor mortis sets in, because there's no more energy in it. The life is gone. There's no more soul in it. There's no more animation. So when God created the heavens and the earth, and then, of course, he formed man out of the dust of the soil, and then he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, he animated these bodies, which with your soul. So... This um, act of creation is, um, is science. You build a AC unit, you plug it up, and now it works. You unplug it, it doesn't work. Science. Their energy has to go into the unit. It powers the unit. The unit works. The soul goes into the body, powers the body. The, the soul leaves. The body doesn't work. It's the same concept. Can we know God? Is that even possible? We can know him on the physical level. Like I said, we can see the creation. We can know, you know, prophets have prophecy. They have visions. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So here God's telling Isaiah, I knew you before you went into your mom. 
before I formed you in the womb, before I sent you to earth. Deuteronomy 4 and 35. To you, it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself he is, <clears throat> that you might know that the Lord himself is God and there is none, <clears throat> none other besides him. So you might know it was shown you at Mount Sinai. They were shown. What does it say? You saw no form. You only heard. You know who created the heavens and the earth. You didn't see a form do it. You just seen the display of power. When he spoke from the mountain and the thunder and the fire and all the smoke and all those things, that was a display put on. And it says, you saw no form. Go back and read. You saw no form. You only heard a voice. Exodus 5 and 2. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Did Pharaoh choose to know the Lord? So he could have told Moses, excuse me, I don't know who God is, but can you introduce me? But what did he say? I don't know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So not only do I not know him, I don't care. And I'm not letting Israelites go. I'm not doing it. He didn't choose to know. He didn't choose to say, man, you know what? You're pretty bold to come into my courts, demanding I let Israel go. And uh, I don't know who you represent, but you must have no fear of me. Or you must got some trick up your sleeve. You must got something in your back pocket that I'm not aware of for you to come and make such a claim with no army, you know, no bargaining chips, just you telling me what I got to do in my house. That should at least spark a little curiosity, but he hardened his heart <laughs> and didn't want to know. Exodus 9, 14. For at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your service and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. So even though Pharaoh did not choose to know the Lord, he still knew what was happening. He didn't want the work, but he got that work in a little bit over time. So all creation is a vessel. These vessels hold a spirit that animates it. These vessels show the glory of God. They show the wisdom of God. They show the power of God. They show the knowledge of God. <clears throat> they show the love of God. They show the judgment of God. He used the elements to punish Egypt. The sun became dark. There was hell. He used the animals, insects. Like there was problems. And Israel got shown the love of salvation and redemption. So while Egypt was being punished, Israel was being um, saved. The heavens and the earth hold or contain the visible glory of God. The soul or spirit holds the unseen glory of God because you cannot see anybody's spirit. You can only experience, you know, what they do through their body, but you cannot see the soul. Of course, there's exceptions to the rule. There are people who can see people's aura. And people can see when people you know, have departed. There's some people who can see the spirits and ghosts or however you want to term that. Some people can see these things. But the average person does not see these things. But we do see the results of these things or entities we call spirits or demons or whatever you want to term them. But the heavens and the earth, the, the man, were all vessels. Even those spirits and demons and whatever you want to call them, they also are, are vessels. Read the story of King Saul and the evil spirit that God put on him, that David got rid of by playing music. No blood. None of that. The ruling vessel has instructions. So... Man is the vessel to bring the words of the law into the world and utilize them or harness them. Man is the ruling vessel. Proverbs 13, 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. The law of the wise, the Torah of the wise. <clears throat> In other words, um, sometimes when you see 
law or the word instruction, it's not always Torah. Sometimes it can mean discipline. So just to, you know, give you a background on that. Um, some translations don't always say this exact same thing. So sometimes, um, you know, the word instruction or law is translated as musar or discipline as well, <clears throat> which is another vital thing. If you're not disciplined, then you can make mistakes. Proverbs 8, 12 through 15. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. So but with, with the, this specific counsel and sound wisdom that kings reign and rulers decree the justice from, what is that? That would be the law of the wise. That would be the Torah. That would be Musar. That would also be discipline or instruction in order to bring these things about <clears throat> through the vessels, of course. Just like gas has to go in the motor, the motor propels the boat to the ocean. There's, there's vessels involved in all this. Purpose of the time, energy, and vessels. Exodus 13, 9. It shall be as a sign to you in your hand, on your hand, and as a memorial, memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with the strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. So the purpose is to put this Torah in the mouth of the people. Exodus 18, 20. You shall teach them the statutes and laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. So that we have a job to do. Exodus 44, 23, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the clean and the, between the unclean and the clean. So you got to make distinctions. You got to know the purpose of the time, energy, and vessels. Because as a stargazer, you can manipulate time. As a practicer of, you know, different types of craft, you can manipulate energy and you can manip manipulate vessels. So you have to be very careful <clears throat> with dealing with time, energy, and vessels and their purpose. To know good and evil, Genesis 3.22, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. <clears throat> so now we've been introduced to good and evil. There's no turning back. Deuteronomy 1.13, choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from all among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. So to make leaders in this world, we need to choose wise, understanding, understanding and knowledgeable people. Not just popular people. Not because of people's beauty, not because of their muscles or how much money they got. Wise, understanding, and knowledgeable Proverbs 12 and 26, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. That says so much about so many things. Whatever you do, choose carefully. Why good and evil? Psalm 37, 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Genesis 15 and 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. So reward is when you overcome evil and do good. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. So now that we know these things, what are we going to do about it? Why no good and evil? Well, God originally said, you know, don't eat from the tree. And we didn't listen and we see the results. So we know evil, but we also know good because from that span of time, you know, thousands of years, we've seen a lot of good come to the world. Lots of families born, lots of technology, lots of creation. And we've seen a lot of destruction as well. But 
this is what happens when you know good and evil and you have cho choices and you know out of the billions of people on earth everybody's not going to fall under the same branch of thinking the lord rewarded me second samuel 22 and 21 the lord rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the clean cleanliness the cleanness of my hands and he has recompensed me so we see a reward for being righteous for choosing good over evil. Psalm 19, 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is worn, and in keeping them there is great reward nothing wrong with choosing good right there to do you good in the end psalm 73 and 24 you will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory what does that mean receive me to glory hmm i'll let you think about that one Deuteronomy 8, 16, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do you good in the end. So if a person is 80 years old, kept out of his vote his whole life, and he's about to die, and let's say, uh, you know, he's only got a, a grandson or something, you know, is that or somebody, even if he has, you know, a whole family to leave something to, is that doing him good in the end, or does that just mean in the end of his life, now he gets to walk into his eternal life. He's no longer in the spiritual, in his physical body. Now his spirit is going to return to God who gave it. And then the real life begins that he might test you to do you good in the end. Ponder, 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 ponder on that one. Then I understood their end. Psalm 73, 12 through 17. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children when I thought how to understand this. It was too painful for me until I went to the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. He's basically in Psalm 73 stressing out about why the wicked get away with murder. You know, figure of speech, but why does everything always work for them? And me trying to be righteous, he said, you know, basically I have cleansed my heart in vain. Like I should, I should be like everybody else. They out here getting money, doing the wrong things. How come I, I might as well do that same thing? This is not working out for me. He says, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Meaning, he went and saw, of course, the glory of the Shekinah, um, possibly the Mishkan. And, um, he saw what the Torah's wisdom did to change Israel as a people. And then he also, of course, he could talk to the priests, ask them questions because they was in the sanctuary. And then he saw the end of these wicked people. He knew how they were living. He knew how they were ending. Deuteronomy 32 and 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways of judgment, a God of truth, and in without iniquity, just and right is he. So he's the rock. He's perfect. All his ways are judgment. And he's not playing. Judgment can be good or bad. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. That's your end is when you understand God's ways and you act accordingly. Like Deuteronomy 8, 16, I will reward you in your end. Conclusion. God created time, space, energy, and matter as vessels to display his will to give us a chance to choose his instructions to attain eternal life. First verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For in the beginning, God created the beginning and the end.
Psalm 133, 1 through 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the streets of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing for life evermore. So, like I said, very um, simple approach. I'm sure you can find much, much deeper videos um, um, on the topic of in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I wanted to keep it pretty simple. Like I said, I threw out one little secret um, that I came across that he created the beginning and the end. And the beginning and the end in the beginning, you know, um, a lot, a lot more to discuss on this, but I wanted to make this real simple and quick just to give you a, you know, a real simple explanation, something you can explain to kids um, of what exactly does Genesis 1 and 1 tell us. So with that being said, um, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Shalom.